Hi, I'm Peter Grenader. In this video, I'm going to summarize a recent redesign and reconstruction I did of a modular synthesizer for the band Tool. Uh, first, a little context. Let's start at the beginning. About nine and a half years ago, Danny Carey asked me to put together a modular system for their live shows. Uh, it predominantly consisted of modules that I actually used to manufacture, Plan B, later known as EAR. Uh, about a quarter of it was some excellent modules from other manufacturers, and it was all put inside this amazing hand-built aluminum case made by Chaz Smith. Let's have a quick look at it. This is actually the day I delivered it to Danny. What's cool? Check this out. Oh, look at this. When you get farther back, you get this blue tone. That's what it's going to look like on stage. So oh, yeah, cool. that's rad. So for almost the last decade, that system has been traveling around the world with the band. And last year, we decided to add a second system to uh, the live rig, a Phoenix 4. I did not make this instrument. Uh, it was a great addition. Uh, have a look, and then... Uh, Let's listen to the combined result of the two together. Fairly quickly into that tour, Danny's uh, tech guys realized how much easier it was to transport the Phoenix in a road case than the toolbox, the modular, in its albeit beautiful but extraordinarily heavy aluminum case. So Danny asked me to work on a conversion to move the toolbox into a road case. So I started off by getting a huddle together of subcontractors I would need to do this thing right. Uh, Jim Turner at a and Cases, Christine at LMB Heger, they make the chassis boxes, uh, John Loftlink of Genus Modu. First, I located all the components that would be in the road case, namely the bus boards by Lib, the isolation transformers for the balanced outputs, and I laid those all out on a piece of MDF using threaded inserts to make sure they would be held down securely, roadworthy. Four rows of modules. Each row can be separately removed. This is the back plane with the threaded inserts. I have two lib bus boards mounted, two of those standoffs, two transformers for the balanced outputs. The output of the patch and the system is going to go into these two bottom out inputs. In the output module, there'll be a level pot, and through the back, we'll go into this terminal block, and then route it through these transformers, and then out these two tip ring sleeve output stereo. Let me pull this stuff out and show you the back access. Whoa. Right there. This could be power on the bottom and stereo outputs recessed so you can stack it anywhere and it won't be damaged. I then laid in the harness, making sure that the wire gauge was sufficient for the load we'd be dealing with, and the audio path was physically separated from the DC and shielded, and it was all battened down securely. Then I turned my attention to the power system. This time I wanted the power supply out of the box. One, it'll make the system 15 pounds lighter. It'll make it more reliable because most failures are power related. Without space constraints, I can go with a very robust power system, five amps, twice as much as the load we need, but it will make it very efficient. I ended up making a custom power box, separate supplies for the plus and minus voltage, fan cooled with its own Pelican case. With the system now fully assembled, it was time for a hot test. 
Okay, here's my first power-up test um, using a very makeshift temporary power cable out of a sacrifice free conductor extension cord. It's, it's not the right gauge wire. It's a very iffy connection, so I have to be careful. I buzzed it out. It was fine. I'm sure this is going to work out okay, but let's see. Here we go. Hey! Excellent. Negative and plus 12 is working fine. Uh, for those that know lip boards, there's a third LED there that's not on yet, the five volts. That little printed circuit board right there is the 12 to five volt step down regulator, a recon switcher, but I haven't yet wired the backside of that board, so that's expected. Uh, this is the uh, output module. There's no power switch on the system now. It's right here, of course. It gives you an indication of active plus and minus voltage. Here's the two stereo inputs. There's a master fader. And then there's a headphone output that I need to scale down. I noticed that's way too hot. Um, so that's fine. Those the little conduct, four conductor connector here is the audio output ground signal for stereo, so four wires. It goes, connects to a, let me get some light in there, shielded cable, goes into the isolation transformers, the balance transformers, and then comes out right there. So that's how this little guy works. Um, that's the next test. I'm gonna let it sit here for a while and see if it gets hot. I know it's not. There's no load on this supply at all, so it'll probably take a couple of minutes just for these LEDs to turn off, but it's a good start. Okay, so there was no real doubt, but I had not tested the main balanced outputs. Did just now. Oh. <laughs> There's the other one. At this point it was done. All I had to do was put all the modules in. But neither Danny and I like to keep things the same for too long. And I suggested that we add some modules to increase the system from 6 to 12 independent voices. As it turns out, the two modules highlighted here had never been used in 10 years. Among the additions were six new 2HP modules, a Plan B attenuator, and 1010 Music's fantastic bit box. And along with the new output module you saw before, I did two other custom modules for Danny, a 4HP wide low-pass gate, for a total of three now in the system. I hear that ringing. And the beauty of this is, you can really hear the modes better now. Yeah, low pass mode. And uh, what's called bootle mode, which is both. So let me get rid of this. Uh, Also, a Mark II 8 channel Model 9 mixer to replace the standard 4 channel that did not go without its problems. I'm coming out of the mono output, so that's A and B mounted, uh, mixed together. So, at this output, I'll be able to see the A channel summer and the B channel summer at the flip of a switch. I have the output connected to a scope. You'll see two glaring things. This is the A channel level. It's a little bit over one volt peak to peak. And then here's the B channel. To see if you can see the big problem. Okay, 10 to one absolute gain, but what else? It's 180 degrees out of phase. So what this is telling me is that pin seven of the first op amp, which is the second inverting summer, is not making contact to the circuit. So I don't see the output of that 
op amp and I'm getting signal bled through from the 100K feedback resistor and that's why the amplitude is so much slower. Okay, fixed it. So what you're gonna be seeing, I'm going in the first channel, switch is either center, up, or down, coming out of the stereo output. There's the channel A, which before was out of phase and one-tenth the amplitude. There's channel B. There was one more custom, a two HP wide single attenuator for his nebulae. And now the only thing left was to slap it all together. The first two rows, actually the first three, went in as expected without a problem. It was the fourth one I knew I was going to have to deal with. I have to make one cable harness with multiple ends that connects these, goes under, connects all these, goes under, connects these two, then out. And while these are fairly easy, because it will fit, these have longer boards and I can't even fit the connectors in there when they're mounted. So I might have to unscrew, oh boy, the bottom screws in all 19 modules and take that rail out. In the end, I didn't have to take the rail out. I just had to remove the modules and I got it done. So there it is. It took two months to complete. It was a lot of fun. And thankfully I was working with Danny Carey who will make no concessions for quality. We were able to use the best components available to make sure this is repeatable, reliable, and acoustically silent. Balanced outputs, totally efficient power system, and now the capability of producing 12 independent voices which can be synced or run freely. Was it worth it? For one of the most admired drummers in the world, and the thousands of people that see him nightly? Yeah, I think so.